Hello, my name is Celia Fayola. I'm an assistant professor at UC Irvine in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and the Department of Chemistry. Today, I'll be talking to you about plant aerosol interactions in a changing climate. I've also included my Twitter handle over here on the right at Fayola Lab UCI, if you'd like to follow us and learn more about our research on this topic. Atmospheric aerosol are the solid or liquid particles suspended in the atmosphere. They're classified based on their size and composition. Uh, they encompass a wide range of sizes as illustrated in this figure to the left. So this is showing a, a typical human hair for size scale. So a typical human hair is about 50 to 70 microns in diameter. Atmospheric particles can be quite large uh, as shown with this sand, which is 90 microns in diameter, or they can be quite a bit smaller. So the blue spheres are indicating particles that are 10 microns or, or less in diameter. Those include things like dust and pollen. And the red spheres uh, include particles that are two and a half microns or less in diameter. Uh, often consisting of combustion particles or particles that are primarily composed of, of organic material. And atmospheric particles can also be classified based on their emission or formation pathway. So some particles are emitted into the atmosphere directly as particles, for example, dust and pollen, and those are referred to as primary aerosol. In contrast, uh, some aerosol is formed via the chemistry of gas phase vapors that are emitted. And this aerosol material is referred to as secondary. Aerosol has a number of really important climate effects, uh, which is one of the reasons we're interested in studying them. Um, aerosol scatter incoming uh, radiation, and thus they influence Earth's radiation budget. Some aerosols are particularly good at absorbing radiation, for example, black carbon, and this can produce local warming effects. These types of interactions are referred to as aerosol radiation interactions. Atmospheric aerosol can also act as cloud condensation nuclei or ice nuclei, and thus contribute to cloud formation processes. And as a result, they can influence cloud microphysical properties. For example, the number and size of aerosols that activate to form cloud droplets can influence the cloud's albedo. They can also influence the cloud's height in the atmosphere as well as its lifetime. And these kinds of aerosol effects are referred to as aerosol cloud interactions. I wanna start by thinking about this from the bottom up. So looking at how plants contribute to atmospheric aerosols and clouds. And some of the ways that plants do that are summarized in this schematic here. There are a lot of acronyms in the schematic, so I've provided a little acronym legend on the right-hand side. And we're going to walk through this figure. So I first want to talk about um, primary biological aerosols. So these are emitted directly from plants in the case of pollen or from fungi that are often associated with plants in the form of spores. These primary biological aerosols or bioaerosols uh, can comprise a wide range of sizes. So everything from you know, very small nanometer size in the case of this protein, uh, or this is a virus shown here for scale at about 50 nanometers, all the way up to much, much larger um, sizes, including this pollen grain that's shown on the right. They can also contribute to a substantial portion of the mass of particles in the atmosphere. So up to 80% of the coarse mode mass in the Amazon was attributed to bioaerosols. Importantly, they can also rupture to produce smaller particles. That's what's shown here, looking at these spores that have ruptured and have produced these much smaller particles than the original size of the spore. And this is important for aerosol climate effects because smaller particles can stay in the atmosphere longer and can reach higher altitudes and thus have different uh, effects on the cloud microphysical properties. This rupturing uh, effect is also illustrated in this figure, looking at a size distribution of aerosols during a rupturing event, which is shown in red, compared to a non-event sort of background size distribution. And so the x-axis is the diameter of the particles, 
And the y-axis is dn d log dp, which is essentially the number of particles at those different sizes. And during the rupturing event, there's this clear elevated peak right here around 30 nanometers, showing that these um, ruptured particles can be quite small. In addition, these bio, uh, primary biological aerosols can contain biogenic salts, as shown here in this figure, where this spore uh, was, com was composed of quite a bit of salt. And this is important because salts are really effective at seeding the atmosphere, producing clouds, and potentially contributing to precipitable rain. So in addition to emissions of primary particles, plants are also the largest source globally of gas phase volatile organic compounds. These are compounds such as isoprene, or other terpenes like alpha pinene or beta caryophylline. These compounds are highly reactive. So once they enter, enter the atmosphere, they undergo oxidative chemistry to form semi-volatile organic compounds or low volatile organic compounds. Uh, these compounds um, undergo gas particle partitioning to condense onto pre-existing particle surfaces as shown here, where they're condensing onto the primary biological aerosols or they can nucleate to form new particles. But either way, this organic condensable material is referred to as secondary organic aerosol, or SOA. Plant emissions of VOCs, uh, I'm showing a few representative compound structures here uh, of different terpene compounds. Uh, the emission rates of these compounds are primarily controlled by temperature and light, but that control varies depending on the type of plant. So what's shown in the top here is a deciduous tree that does not have any specialized storage structures for these terpenes. And in that case, the emission rate is a function of the synthesis rate. Uh, and the synthesis rate is a function of both light and temperature. In contrast, this coniferous plant does have a large storage structure being highlighted here. This resin duct can store quite a few terpenes. And the emissions of these terpenes from storage structures is primarily just an exponential temperature function. But what's worth noting is that this coniferous plant, even though it has these storage structures, it also emits compounds that are being generated, uh, you know, de novo synthesis compounds, so compounds that were just made. And those compounds' emission rates will also be light dependent as well as temperature dependent. And so there's this light dependent fraction of emissions and light independent fraction of emissions from plants that have these storage structures. And there are lots of um, models that use those empirical light and temperature functions to predict um, plant VOC emission rates for different types of plants across the globe. But interestingly, plant emissions are also evolving in a changing world due to a couple of different mechanisms. The first I'll talk about is due to plant stress. So plant stress emissions can contribute to a substantial portion of the total emissions from a plant. Sometimes over half of the emissions by mass have been attributed to stress. So I'm providing some examples of different kinds of uh, conditions that could lead to plant stress. Everything from air pollution to increased frequency and severity of insect herbivory and pathogens as well as heat waves and drought. And this has been the topic of a number of different review papers looking at how these um, stress conditions affect plant VOC emissions. And I'm showing just, a three, just three of those review papers here. In addition to plant stress changing plant VOC emissions, we also expect plant VOC emissions to, to shift as a result of shifting plant biogeography in a changing climate. This is a figure from Nolan et al. from uh, Science in 2018. Um, and I'm gonna focus on the top figure here, looking at the probability of large change in vegetation composition across the globe under a couple of different climate scenarios. And even under the more moderate climate scenario, there's over a 50% probability of large change across most of the globe in the types of vegetation that would be found and would thrive. Um, and so because different plant types have different emission rates and emit different kinds of compounds, um, that's going to have a big 
influence on sort of the spatiotemporal distribution of plant VOC emissions across the globe. So this would all influence total emission rates, which will affect the total amount of SOA produced, as well as the size distribution of particles in the atmosphere, which will all have uh, impacts on aerosol radiative effects. But in addition to just changing the total SOA produced and those size distributions, these stress and plant emissions can also alter climate relevant SOA properties. And so one such property I'll give you an example of is liquid liquid phase separation. This refers to the likelihood that a particle will exist uh, with this aqueous core as shown here, coated with this um, organic material around the outside shown in green. And liquid liquid phase separation affects particle growth and chemistry. And so it ultimately influences how likely these particles are to act as cloud condensation nuclei or ice nuclei. And what I'm showing here is a result from some laboratory studies where SOA was generated from a mixture of healthy plant VOCs. And when that SOA was put under very high humidity and then slowly had the humidity decreased, that liquid liquid phase separation persisted only to about 91% RH as indicated with the separation RH value here. In contrast, when SOA was generated, including a plant stress compound known as alpha farnesine, this liquid liquid phase separation persisted to much lower RHs down to 23%. And so this is indicating that these plant stress emissions could have important effects on climate relevant SOA properties. So far, I've been focusing on uh, sort of a bottom up um, perspective on how plants contribute to aerosols and clouds. But now I want to think about this from the top down. So how do aerosols and clouds affect plants? Well, I already mentioned that aerosols can scatter incoming radiation. And as a result, they can increase the proportion of diffuse to direct radiation that impinges on thus plant productivity. And that's what's being shown in these graphs here. So this is looking at the photosynthesis rates of sun leaves and shade leaves as a function of aerosol optical depth. When we look at the effect on sun leaves, there's a very clear increase in photosynthesis with increasing optical depth, aerosol optical depth up to a point around 0.8. Above this value of aerosol optical depth, the total radiation decreases enough that that ends up decreasing photosynthesis rates. The shade leaves show a slightly different trend where the diffuse fertilization effect is observed up to higher aerosol optical depths. These results on the top here are for soybean, uh, soybean leaves. And this aerosol diffuse fertilization effect will vary depending on the type of plant. So for example, for aspen, um, a very different trend is observed where there's no threshold in this aerosol diffuse fertilization effect. Uh, now the shade leaves are still showing a stronger aerosol diffuse fertilization effect than the sun leaves, but, but there is no threshold. And so this demonstrates that the canopy complexity can play a role in the importance of this, uh, this aerosol diffuse fertilization effect. The meteorological context can also play a role, particularly regarding um, the mass loading of aerosols and whether or not clouds are present. So this is showing simulations of the diffuse fertilization effect in China, looking at the change in net primary productivity with and without this uh, diffuse fertilization effect included in the model. And so under clear sky conditions, we see a very large diffuse fertilization effect with NPP increasing by up to three grams of carbon per meter squared per day. In contrast, when all days were included uh, in the, the model simulation, including uh, cloudy days, the results look quite different. So notice first the difference in scale here. So now with cloudy days included, the maximum uh, change in net primary productivity was closer to 0.3 grams of carbon per meter squared per day. 
And in many regions, the effect from aerosols and clouds was actually to reduce net primary productivity because of that reduction in total radiation. Aerosols not only affect um, plant productivity, they also influence evapotranspiration and water use efficiency. And that's what I'm showing here. So the top left simulation is looking at the um, aerosol um, scattering effect on evapotranspiration, where we see across the globe, it mostly decreases evapotranspiration. So we're seeing yellow and red in most areas, which is a decrease in evapotranspiration. The bottom figure is showing water use efficiency and the effect of aerosols on water use efficiency is to increase water use efficiency. So in this case, the green is referring to positive values here. So across most of the globe, aerosol effect is to increase water use efficiency. And this figure on the right is also showing evapotranspiration and water use efficiency uh, now as a function of leaf area index and aerosol optical depth. And I'm showing this just to contrast with the um, aerosol effect on productivity. In this case, even uh, you know, with simple canopies with a low leaf area index to more complex canopies with a very high leaf area index, um, aerosols are decreasing evapotranspiration and increasing water use efficiency across all of these um, conditions. So to summarize what I just said, um, some of the main effects of aerosols and clouds on plants is through their influence on diffuse radiation and total radiation. So atmospheric particles can increase the proportion of diffuse radiation, leading to increases in plant productivity through the diffuse fertilization effect. However, at very high aerosol mass loadings or under cloudy conditions, you get a negative um, impact on total radiation, which can reduce productivity. Do note that I have a positive sign here in parentheses, because in some cases, particularly for sun leaves, if they're already saturated with light and or above their optimum leaf temperature for photosynthesis, then a reduction in total radiation can actually increase productivity as well. Uh, in general, decreases in total radiation will decrease evapotranspiration. And when you decrease evapotranspiration, coinciding with an increase in productivity, you get an increase in water use efficiency. And so I know a lot of scientists who've registered for this workshop who um, study questions related to this box on the left, how plants influence aerosols and clouds. And I also know a lot of scientists who registered for this workshop who study questions related to this box on the right how aerosols and clouds influence um, plants, in particular terrestrial ecosystem function. But a question that I'm posing to this particular audience as we get together in our breakout rooms and discuss is how coupled are these interactions with one another? Um, when I have read land atmosphere coupling papers previously, I haven't really seen them thinking about this question as it pertains to plant aerosol interactions. Um, and if there is some strong coupling between these processes that I've described, uh, there's also the um, possibility for some interesting plant aerosol feedbacks. So I'll walk through one example to illustrate. So let's say we have increased carbon dioxide concentrations with an increase in air temperature that would lead to increased VOC emissions from plants, which would increase SOA production. And the effect of SOA on VOC emissions could go one of two ways. It could be a negative feedback loop on VOC emissions due to cooling because of higher aerosol optical depth and more cloud condensation nuclei and more clouds. Um, and so that would cool temperatures and reduce emissions because emissions are exponentially dependent on temperature. In contrast, we could have an increase in VOC emissions due to an increase in net primary productivity, so an increase in leaf surface area. Uh, and this is due to that diffuse fertilization effect. So I know one paper used a global model, the Norwegian Earth System model, to look at this 
whole process, including both these uh, negative and positive feedback loops between VOCs and SOA production, and found a global net radiative effect of minus 0.49 watts per meter squared, which offset about 13% of the warming that was associated with doubling atmospheric CO2. But I do think there are a lot of remaining uncertainties with regard to this, um, this feedback loop uh, and including sort of fine tuning this to perhaps more, more regional scales um, and, and looking more deeply at uh, how this feedback loop changes for different types of biomes and under different conditions. And I also think there are other important drivers to this feedback loop that haven't been considered in many models. So for example, increased frequency and severity of biotic stressors like insect outbreaks or pathogens or these shifting plant ranges that I was talking about previously. So one of the goals of this workshop is to think about some measurements that could be conducted co-located at Ameriflux sites um, to shed light on land atmosphere interactions. And I'm particularly interested in plant aerosol interactions and potentially this coupling and these feedback loops that I've described here. And so I would argue that some fairly simple long-term aerosol observations co-located with Ameriflux energy carbon and water flux measurements and with boundary layer height could address questions related to these plant aerosol feedbacks. Because this would give us some co-located information on terrestrial ecosystem function, uh, including giving some information on sort of ecosystem health, along with aerosol dynamics and scattering and the boundary layer dy dynamics. And if we combine that with say size distribution, so we could track um, aerosol size distributions changing throughout the day, with those boundary layer dynamics and potentially having some cloud cover information um, with aerosol scattering. I think that could shed a lot of light on this feedback loop that I'm showing here um, and looking at that in different biomes uh, across different seasons. And so with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the discussions we'll have in the breakout rooms shortly. <laughs>